pleased to welcome the program uh, here this afternoon, uh, Professor uh, Rewad Dionandin, epidemiologist, this is, uh, associate professor, Faculty of Health Sciences, University of Ottawa. Uh, professor Dionandin, great to have you back with us here. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much. Great to be back. <laughs> Uh, the question of, of testing and how best to make use of those resources. I mean, obviously, a hard-hit area is just struggling to keep up with the number of cases, the number of sick people. Uh, but once jurisdictions have a bit of room to maneuver, what, what, what's your sense as, as to how best to make use of that? It's a really good question. And I like to think of it in terms of the lens through which to, to view our testing protocol. There are three lenses that come to mind. The first is the clinical lens. The second is the public health lens. And the third is the planning lens. Most people think about the clinical lens. So uh, if you're sick, you get tested to find out what you have so we know how to treat you clinically. The public health lens says we test to figure out who has the disease so we know who to constrain to prevent from spreading it further. And the planning lens says we test to figure out where to spend our resources accordingly. So uh, up till now, most of the decisions have been made through a clinical lens, which is fine when you're at the, the acute phase of the epidemic and you need to control the flow of people into the hospital and to figure out you know, who needs treatment right away. But we're at the, the, the end phase of that first wave, and we need to think about the public health and planning lens more. So I like that places like Saskatchewan is uh, expanding its testing criteria to capture people who perhaps don't even know that they're sick. That's the key to all this. This is an asymptomatic pandemic. We need to be able to identify people who are sick and don't yet know it before they're able to transmit it further. Uh, and, and yeah, and obviously that, that involves testing. Now, typically, as, as we say that, I mean, in, when, when you're sort of in, in the midst of, of the outbreak and, you know, people are, are calling their doctor, calling their health line and, and saying, I think I have symptoms, you know, I have a cough, I have a fever. That's where you're deploying those resources, right? Obviously, someone who has no symptom is not likely to phone and, and ask for a test. So how do you go about making that, that sort of transition? How, how, do you, how do you convince people right. who seem to be feeling fine that maybe it's something they, they should do or need to do? Well, maybe it's useful to think about, you know, why we're testing in the first place. What we're talking here is something called surveillance, which is a scary word for people not in the epidemiological field. But disease surveillance is simply looking for the disease. And there are three kinds of disease surveillance. The first is sentinel, which means we identify a couple of institutions that are on alert for the disease. That's not really relevant here. The second is passive, where we wait to see who comes to the door. That's what we've had so far. You're sick, you call your doctor, you show up at the testing center. And that's been sort of useful up till now. But what's needed now is active surveillance. That's where we go out and hunt the disease. So we're looking for places where it is that maybe we didn't know where it was. So the way to convince people that this is a way to go about doing it is to show them that active surveillance is literally um, being proactive about finding where this thing is so we can quash it. But also it's a way to have people feel safer. If they can be sure that uh, them and their loved ones and people in their community are, if not negative, at least are being watched and the positive people are being curtailed. That's a way to sort of curtail some of the panic that may come out of all this. Right. And I mean, obviously, we, we don't have the ability and maybe we'll never have the ability to just test everybody or be testing people constantly. Um, you know, I mean, if, if somehow that existed, uh, you know, that, that would go a long way in keeping this in check. So short of that, uh, you know, I mean, how do we prioritize? Because there, there are a lot of professions where you can envision there's there's value in testing a little more regularly. Clearly, we have issue, has issues with long term care, for example, and so the idea of testing those who work in long-term care or maybe more regularly testing those in, in, in health care, that makes yeah, sense. So but how, how do you prioritize yeah. that? The, the clinical lens, is, again, means that we must test anyone walking into a hospital, let's say, or, or walking into a long-term care center or a prison, especially places where you are restrained in how much movement you can have. So if you're in a prison, you can't go anywhere, you're kind of stuck, everyone should be tested and make sure that they're, uh, they're safe. But what we need, again, is active surveillance. And that also means random testing. So consider that uh, there's a cockroach in a dark room. The cockroach is a virus. It's moving about. If you're waiting for the cockroach to come to you and present itself, you're going to wait a long time. So you need a, a flashlight to move around randomly in the room to occasionally see it. So that's what um, the active surveillance using random uh, testing does. So I'm glad to see that places like Saskatchewan is opening up its criteria, but that's not good enough. The next step has to be actively hunting the virus with random testing. Um, to answer your question directly, is uh, who do we test? Uh, how do we deploy this? Well, 
everyone, obviously, those at high risk, uh, the immunocompromised who are about to undergo um, cancer therapies, for example, pregnant women who are about to uh, give birth. Um, the question then becomes, though, what do you do if you test positive? You're not going to tell a pregnant woman, don't give birth. You know, so you have to have uh, protocols in place to, to ameliorate and to respond to the positive outcome. Um, that's another story entirely. So all of this, is, the public health infrastructure is built into the medical infrastructure, built into the decision-making infrastructure. These things can't work in isolation. No, it's true. And as you say, I mean, testing involves uh, tracing, that involves isolation. And so it's it's got to involve all of those steps, right? So that you're, you're keeping the virus in check. Yeah, not just in check, but you're hunting it down. I keep saying that, but that's what it is. Yeah. Uh, we yeah. can't be passive about this. The way to prevent a second wave, well, a second wave is probably inevitable, but the size of it is not inevitable. The way to, to curtail the pos- possible um, hugeness of a second wave is to identify cases beforehand and descend upon them with overwhelming force to suppress them, to prevent them from becoming outbreaks and prevent outbreaks from becoming epidemics. This is totally possible. It just means a lot of surveillance and testing, um, active testing of people without symptoms, because we know that possibly the majority of community spread is through the asymptomatic. If we're only relying upon those with even mild symptoms that come forward, you're going to miss a large number of people who are spreading the disease, particularly young people. So um, as the economies open up, we have to spend more time and attention on how this is unfolding amongst the young, who very often do not suffer symptoms uh, are serious enough to warrant medical intervention, but are nonetheless transmitting it to other people. So those are the people I would like to see tested more in addition to the clinically ill. Yeah, and it's an interesting point because part of it is helping us to, to really understand this virus, which is still relatively new. I mean, speaking as an epidemiologist, and, and I think there's a lot of Monday morning uh, quarterbacking going on when it comes to epidemiologists oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, who are tasked with, look, here's this brand new virus that we're learning about and tell us what it's going to do uh, in the months ahead. And, and, you know, to understand, as you say, how many asymptomatic uh, infections are we talking about? What is the, the infection rate? All of these things we're trying to factor in and get a sense of, well, this is what worst case could look like. This is what best case could look like. And, yeah, I guess people are going to go back and, and nitpick that after the fact, aren't they? Absolutely. So data is everything. We're in the phase of the pandemic now where it's less and less about doctors and even less about epidemiologists and more about data nerds. So the better quality data we have, the better we can plan and cure resources accordingly. Some countries have done this really well. I'm impressed by Iceland, who had a random screening process from day one. And, of course, South Korea is the world leader in in strategic deployment of testing. So Mm -hmm. there are models for us to follow. We don't need to spend all of our money and resources randomly. We can do so strategically and cost-effectively. So it's a matter of just good planning from this point on. Now, the the bigger question about what does massive testing give us, it gives us a sense of the true extent of the disease. Also, it gives us a sense of where it is so we can deploy our resources accordingly, but also it gives us a sense possibly of, of the dimensions and characteristics of the disease. It's true fatality rate. It's true comorbidity rate. It's true effects on all members of society and not just the ill. So there's so much left to learn about this disease that only a wide testing regimen can answer for us. I think it involves not just testing for current infections, but serological testing that can give us a, a, a more of a, a picture of, you know, what the, the total impact has been previous infections, for example. That's right. And everybody wants to know about the antibody test. Health Canada has cleared one such test for use in Canada. There are dozens of them on the open market, but they're not all great. So now that this new test is available in Canada, I expect to see a lot of good research projects come forth to, to check for the zero prevalence, as we call it in our communities. That will tell us a number of things. One, it'll tell us um, the true infection fatality rate, because it'll give us a denominator of who's been infected. Two, it'll tell us how close we are to herd immunity. We're not very close, I'll tell you that, but it'll tell us you know, where along that curve we are. And three, it'll tell us something about immunity. Uh, we're now getting a better sense through some experimentation that recovery does confer immunity, and now we want to know how much immunity that is and how long it will last, and maybe eventually lead us to something resembling an immunity passport. So these are the tools and the tests and the information that will allow us to return to some semblance, some semblance of pseudo-normalcy. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I think there was a hope maybe that some countries uh, might be close to, to something approaching herd immunity, but I mean, they, you know, they figure 
maybe 5% zero prevalence in, in Spain, maybe something similar in Sweden. Uh, that, yeah. That's not even remotely close to herd immunity, is it? That's exactly right. I think the highest number I've seen is New York State at 14.9%, and even that's a, a wild estimate. So, no, we're not even close at all. There, there, I mean, there's some hope that maybe the threshold for herd immunity is lower than we thought because people aren't mixing homogeneously. People sort of, you know, uh, relate to just their close circle of friends. So that sort of helps. Um, but even even those conservative or optimistic estimates have, um, have herd immunity kicking in at 20%, and we're nowhere near that. Uh, I'm endlessly an optimist, and I have faith that our public health infrastructure can get us out of this or at least prevent a serious second wave from happening. And as we wait for the vaccine or on the new flotilla of treatments that are coming at us fast and furiously, that may offer some, some hope and, uh, and relief. Um, but, in, but absent technological innovation and, uh, and a technological savior, testing is our best strategy. The current testing technologies aren't great. The swab test is, is okay, but it's not useful because of the time it takes to send to the lab and get results back. Yeah. What we need is rapid on-site testing, and those are coming too. Yeah, that's encouraging. We'll leave it there. Uh, Dr. Dianand, did appreciate your insight, and uh, thanks so much for making some time for us here today. Thank you. All right, take care. Uh, that is uh, Dr. Ray Watt uh, Dianandin, uh, epidemiologist, uh, professor of the uh, Faculty of Health Sciences, University of Ottawa. So-